All right, and, and we, we are just about to start uh, live streaming on Facebook, so then we will get started. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'll just kick it off. My name is Ashley Han. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications with the Unified Government. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are kicking off something that many of you have been eagerly awaiting, so we're thrilled to have you here today. This is the Notice of Funding Availability for the American Rescue Plan uh, Act, which is, as you are well aware, the federal funds that were provided to Wyandotte County and the City of Kansas City, Kansas, as part of our pandemic recovery. So it's really targeted towards our pandemic response and what we need to be doing as a community to make sure that uh, we kind of address some of the incredible impacts that this has had across our community. Uh, on the phone with me today or on the line, I have with me both Erica Hupka uh, and Erica Hupka too, which <laughs> Emily, your, your name, uh, what's, I apologize, I don't know what your last name is off the top of my head. Emily Noyes. <laughs> Emily Noyes. Very nice to have you. Both of uh, uh, are part of the iParametrics team, which is our partner on this grant application. And if you reach out to the email or phone number that is parted, uh, part of this uh, notice of funding availability, these are the folks that will be answering your questions as they are our technical advisors on the grant process and have done some great work in helping us get this set up. Um, as you may have been watching over the last several months, the ARPA subcommittee has been meeting with the goal of kind of honing in on where to prioritize funding. And uh, we arrived at, to this point where the um, commission is now ready to put forward an opportunity for you to apply for funds as a nonprofit or a unified government department. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Erica, who's going to walk us through this process and uh, we will also be accepting your questions through uh, the Q&A, so I'll be tracking that and we will um, pose those questions to our subject matter experts. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ashley. So we're gonna start off today by going through the notice of funding availability, just to make sure that we give you all um, the understanding of what you can find within the documents. Obviously, there's a lot of material in there. So we've also posted it online in English and Spanish. So it's on the UG's internal ARPA, or the UG's webpage for ARPA. Um, and you can find any of the contact information for us there as well. So we'll go into this document here in just a little bit. And then after that, we'll walk you through the portal and what that looks like and give you um, the opportunity to kind of walk through that with us with a demo um, applicant and we'll be able to answer any questions you may have related to that. Again, this is a lot of material, so we have it recorded. You can go back and view it again as you need to. Uh, and then um, obviously Emily and I are here to answer any questions that you have as well. So starting off, we have our notice of funding availability and the really um, important pieces of this start on page six, where we go over the types of um, expenditures that are allowable under the ARPA funding. All of this is dictated by the Treasury Department's final rule relating to ARPA expenditures. So we have to make sure that any of the approved projects fit within these categories. And they've actually with the final rule broadened that out quite a bit uh, to allow us a lot more leeway on the types of projects that we can do. Essentially, it's uh, anything that will improve community resilience. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're investing in our workforce and making sure that they are more resilient going forward. And that we're also uh, taking some funds to diminish um, negative impacts on, in society to include family violence, um, and then making sure that we're addressing things like wastewater and um, internet access in underserved areas. So it, it really is a very broad brush on the types of projects that we can put forward under this um, funding. So we also go into um, what the definitions for each of the um, pieces are within the document. For the purpose of this, the awardee would be the person who is um, applying and has been granted the funds. And um, with the awardees, there is also a closeout procedure that we'll go into later. It's important that, again, for the Treasury Department that we close all of our loops. I wanna make sure to bring this in early and often because there is that burden of documentation that we really need to make sure that we have uh, so that everybody gets to maintain the funds that they have been uh, allocated. So with this, we're looking for projects that um, address short-term needs of the community, but will also uh, improve resilience of the community. They need, uh, you need to operate within Wyandotte County. That doesn't mean you have to be based in Wyandotte County, but it does mean that you need to serve residents of Kansas City, Kansas and or Wyandotte County. 
and that you um, are able to demonstrate that your organization has a capacity to achieve the project that you're putting forward and that you have a viable budget for the project to show that you have um, really put in the um, all the necessary pieces you need to be successful with the project that you're proposing. Now within ARPA, the Unified Government has put forward three program priorities that include community health and well-being, infrastructure and the built environment, and organizational and community resilience. So we're really looking for specific projects that address these pieces that greatly impact Wyandotte County. Again, those that are eligible are anything, uh, any of the projects that would be approved under the final rule with ARPA and are beneficial to Wyandotte County or Kansas City, Kansas residents. And we have within the document several times the link to the final rule. So just in case you're curious whether or not the project that you would like to propose fits, certainly click on that. And, and um, within the final rule documentation, they have a very uh, handy summary document and then the full guidance document. So use whichever piece of that uh, works best for you. Again, we need to make sure that all these funds support um, public health are related to COVID-19 and the um, pieces that were um, brought to our attention during COVID-19. So um, such as the need for certain types of employees, the need for um, adequate water, sewer infrastructure with broadband, those pieces that um, really the pandemic brought front and center for us. So again, all of those pieces are listed there. Some um, examples of eligible funds uh, expenditures are um, staff salaries, enhancement installation and fortification of digital infrastructure, again, the um, broadband piece, um, technical and life skills training, uh, creation or expansion of child care services, emergency assistance, uh, food security, mental health and well-being, and uh, other measures that respond to or uh, mitigate the impact of COVID-19. However, there are also some examples of ineligible funds, and those include things like pension funds, financial reserves, non-COVID response construction, reimbursement for costs incurred prior to the program, purchase of equipment that's not directly tied to the program work, political or religious activities, entertainment, pre-award costs, so anything before the time that you were granted, Fundraising activities, operational costs that are associated with day-to-day -day functions, so not things that are specific to pandemic mitigation or resilience. Fundraising activities, operational costs, um, and payroll benefits, and expenses not incurred due to public health emergencies. So really, we again, we're trying to provide as much clarity as we can around the types of expenditures that will be allowed under this funding. Um, we have a certain amount of funds that are available um, for ARPA and the determination of the limitations for that will be determined by the ARPA subcommittee and the commission. And we need to have all applicants um, submit their application by the end of May, May 26th. And all expenditures or all um, funds have to be allocated by December 31st, 2024. And um, all those obligations need to be submitted to the UG no later than the 10th of January in 2025. However, despite the need for the uh, allocation to be done prior to that, all funds need to be spent prior to December 31st, 2026. And again, all of this is within the ARPA um, rules. We also have um, the link to our grants portal within this document and a QR code just to make it easier for those that are using mobile devices to apply. And the deadlines um, are here within the, I apologize, the um, application is due on the 27th. Um, but all of the deadlines for awards, expenditures, closeouts um, are within this uh, table here on page 11. And you are allowed to um, modify or withdraw your application anytime before the due date, just contact Emily or myself. We have some application scoring here. And again, this is going to be uh, determined by the um, ARPA subcommittee and the commissioners to um, wait and um, determine which projects best meet not only the commission's priorities, but also the uh, treasury and ARPA intent. And for each application, you must enter all of your applicant information and your qualifications, your project proposal, 
your proposed budget, and you must certify uh, that you have no conflicts of interest, or if you do, what they are. And then again, once the application period closes, we will um, provide all those to the ARPA subcommittee who will then make recommendations. And um, once awards have been, uh, awardees have been identified, then we will contact you um, via email from there. Ashley, do we have any questions on this portion of the presentation? Not yet. Okay. And so Emily, if you oh, my apologies, mind. my apologies, there is a uh, question regarding, uh, is there a match commitment? There is not a match commitment. However, um, if you do have a match, you need to make sure that you have proof of the match and uh, it would be beneficial for your application to include that. All right, and we do have a second question. Can nonprofits submit multiple applications? You may submit multiple projects within your application. The uh, portal will allow you to submit as many projects as you would care to put forward. And uh, can you define resilience? Resilience is the ability to um, I'll Return. take this one if you want. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. That would yeah, be great. So resilience is kind of the acknowledgement that we know that catastrophic events and um, things that will likely fail, that's inevitable. And it, so it's not necessarily about preventing that from happening, but how you can recover from that. So anticipating the ability to respond to something, uh, any, whether it's a small uh, problem or a large disaster such as a global pandemic, it's the ability to recover and be prepared for that. So resilience is really about anticipating those challenges and preparing your, your community and your organization to respond to that. And the other piece of that too is the, the flexibility and the um, ability to not necessarily anticipate everything that's going to be coming, but to be able to support a broad range of needs so that everybody can get back to the new normal. We do have uh, two more questions. When will awardees be notified by? We uh, currently have that projected. Apologies, let me get back up to, there we go. Um, we are expecting to be able to notify uh, awardees no later than the 29th of uh, July. However, if there is a um, further di uh, discussion that's needed by the commission, we do reserve the right to kick, uh, to, to move that further out. Uh, and then uh, two more questions. Would awardees be a sub-recipient or beneficiaries for audit purposes? I will have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Uh, and working with uh, food insecurity, uh, sometimes things are vague. Can you give us an example of a project? Um, relating to food insecurity, uh, it would be, I would think um, a resilience garden, a um, means for food distribution in an emergent event, uh, we can certainly work offline. If you would care to email us, we'd, we'd be happy to brainstorm with you on what some of those ideas could be. Excellent. Okay, the, com the questions keep on coming. I don't know if you wanna hold them till the end or if you wanna keep going, I've got quite a few more. Um, Emily, are you, we ready to walk through the portal? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think that some of these may be able to be answered by going through the portal real quick. So we'll do that and then we'll um, finish Perfect. the rest of the questions, but we'll make sure to answer everybody's questions as best we can before we finish today. Okay, so this is the portal that um, applicants will use to initially register for their organization for application. Um, and then we will have a, uh, once this is complete, applicants will then receive a link to the actual application site where you will submit your projects. 
we do this so that we have the opportunity to sort out those that uh, would not necessarily qualify before they spend all the time uh, invested in identifying their project and putting all the information in that they need for that. So this is our ability to have that initial pre-check uh, to make sure that the applicant is in fact a nonprofit or does work with the UG um, before they invest that time. So um, we're asking, you know, uh, is your organization within Wyandotte County and then what the entity name is and which of the categories you fit under and um, are you current on property taxes? Again, if you are um, an organization outside of the UG. And then we're asking for basic contact information. It's really important to ensure that the email address provided here is correct because that is how we will communicate with you and make sure to send you the link for the actual registration itself. Once you submit that, then it will uh, the system will generate a, an application link to you and email that. And see if I can get the application. And again, this um, this this two part process um, hopefully will make it simpler going forward as well for those that um, maybe don't qualify for this. We have other opportunities for funding under ARPA, such as small business. So uh, this also allows us the opportunity to connect you with other opportunities if you don't fit within these categories. And here's the actual application itself. And um, it, again, goes into what the program is. You can choose English or Spanish on either of these options by just clicking a, the radio button at the top. Um, and let's see. Again, you'll be asked to put in all of the information about your organization to include physical location, um, FEIN, date of inception, um, and then just go over some basic uh, solvency issues such as bankruptcy or, um, you know, have you, for internal departments, have you received approval to apply for uh, these funds? And then you can also click if you have business certification such as Section 3, minority owned business, um, disabled veterans, etc. Next, we're going to ask for an authorized representative. Now, this is the person who is representing the organization. This does not necessarily need to be a CEO, a COO, an owner. Uh, this could be anyone who has the ability to um, apply on behalf of your organization. And then you can also include um, whether or not that authorized re representative is the same as a primary contact and uh, make sure that you include all of the necessary contact information there, because again, if you have any questions, that's how we will contact you. Now we're going to ask for a, an overview of what your organization is, especially for our nonprofit partners. It's really important for us to understand what the mission, vision, and values are of your organization so that we have a, a better understanding of what your project um, will be able to provide for our um, community. For each project, again, we, you can submit multiple projects under this uh, singular portal, but for each project, we need a project title, what the problem is that you're trying to solve, description of the project, and then identification of which of the community priorities your project aligns with. And so here's the list of them there. And, and um, so we would ask for not only which of them it falls under, but a description of um, why. And then we're also asking how many Wyandotte County residents or Kansas City, Kansas residents your project would impact or serve. And then the project area um, to include zip codes, intersections, um, areas, uh, census tracts, however you happen to measure that service area, we would want you to uh, reflect that there. And then um, how your project will solve the identified problem that you have noted related to uh, resilience or mitigation of pandemic of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we're gonna be summarizing how these funds are going to improve um, resiliency as well. And so again, um, you can click the button to add more proposals if you would care to. And we have text documents that we would ask you to download, fill out, and then re-upload. Um, and those are giving the um, budget narrative and the organizational capacity. So they're um, Excel spreadsheets that, um, excuse me, Word documents and Excel spreadsheets that walk you through the pieces of information that we need. 
And then once done, you, you drag and drop those um, files back into the portal here and it will attach it to your application and your project. So um, one of the things that we're hoping to also use to inform the decision of which applications move forward is uh, past performance. So if you have past performance success, go ahead and upload it here. You know, give us a little brag book. Let us know what good things you have done for our community so that we have that to go from. And then again, if you have matching funds, upload your proof of funds there. And again, that is um, something that we are looking for with um, funding these applications. We want to make sure to try to make our dollars stretch as far as we can, because obviously it's a limited resource. So the more impact we can have on our community, the better. Uh, additionally, if there's alternative funding that has been provided for the application, for instance, if you've also gotten um, funding from the state or from another organization, another federal agency, um, go ahead and list that there. And then the amount and any documentation you may have. And then if you have really, uh, received any pandemic related funds, meaning for the previous iterations of CARES funding um, and other fundings that have been made available, go ahead and include those there in the amount and any documentation you may have. Um, and then where you receive those funds from. And finally is the conflict of interest statement. We need to make sure that every applicant signs the conflict of interest statement, um, certifying that they don't have any of these um, conflicts that they need to report or to disclose. And the knowledge and consent for the purpose of the um, grant itself, again, authorizing the unified government to uh, share the information that's provided here within the um, deciding group. And again, this is a an open uh, discussion. So if there's anything that you have that is uh, sensitive information, please email Emily and I, and we will work with you on how to um, work with that information. And again, make sure that you check the box that says that the typed in signature there is the same as is equivalent to a handwritten signature, and then you submit and it will uh, put it into the system so that Emily and I can um, review that documentation, ensure that we have all the pieces that we need and then when the application closes, then we'll put that forward to the ARPA subcommittee for review. And um, again, Emily and I will be available to you at any point during this if you need help understanding what um, each of these pieces is asking for, what types of information to put in, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at ugmssupport at iparametricsds.com or our phone number is 913-386 Seven six zero zero. All right, I think that that's it. Emily, did I miss anything? Um, the only thing that I'd point out is we do have a document throughout the um, program. It's called the Program Overview and Instructions. It does give a really good overview of the actual program and how to apply step by step. So if you have any you know quick questions and you want to review that document, it might answer some of those. And then also where you can find the application on the website. Well, we have quite a few questions and just note everyone that uh, our partners, Emily and Erica are excellent at tracking FAQs, which we will provide on our website as they uh, continue to come in. But in the meantime, let's get to a few more of your questions this morning. Um, the first question is uh, regarding uh, is, does the restriction on redistribution simply foreclose pass-through pass grants or more broadly limit the use of funds? For example, this would seem to prohibit direct financial assistance to eligible households rather than the expenditure of ARPA funds by the applicant or organization itself. Um, Kathleen, do you happen to have the answer to that one? Okay, so um, I'm not really sure I understood the question. Can you repeat it again? Sure, Kathleen. So the question is about whether or not the organization that's applying for the funds has to use them or if they could use it as a pass through to provide direct financial assistance to eligible households. Oh, yeah, both. Both. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, yeah. The, the next. Uh, 
uh, question is, will you send this NOFA document to the reg web webinar registrant? Absolutely. We want you to have this information. Uh, I will follow up immediately following this uh, webinar with some information for you. We also have a list that we've been maintaining uh, folks that were involved in, as our partners through the CARES Act process. Um, and we've continued to add to that list as people have reached out to us over the last several months uh, with their interest in the American Rescue Plan. So we will be sending that out following this, uh, uh, this webinar sometime today. So look forward to that. But again, it is available on our website at ycokck.org slash ARPA, A-R-P-A. Uh, what is the total amount available under the specific funding cycle is uh, the next question. Uh, I, Kathleen, do you I, want to address that? Yeah, I can, I can get that. So this is Kathleen Financial, the CFO. And um, Thursday, we have an ARPA subcommittee meeting. And uh, one of the agenda items on the meeting is the committee will be discussing um, the total amount that is being allocated for these grants or for this web portal grant or nonprofit UG web portal grant process. Um, so at the moment, we don't um, know the total. Um, whatever it is, it will be split up between city and county and um, but once we do know, then of course we'll put it out on the website, and um, yeah, so we'll know in a few. You know, we hopefully we'll know Thursday, but maybe two weeks from now too. So we'll see. Yeah, and so that meeting is tomorrow uh, afternoon from three thirty to five p.m. via Zoom, which we also broadcast via um, YouTube and uh, Facebook. So you can watch or join us again for that meeting and that discussion. Uh, but it is an ongoing discussion, as Ms. Von Achen mentioned. Okay. Uh, next question is. Um, uh, does the organization have to be a 501c3 certified organization or would we become a nonprofit in the process of seeking a 501c3 status? Yeah, if you're in the process of um, seeking 501c3 status, that would be okay too, I think. <laughs> Excellent. And we have had quite a few questions regarding where the nonprofit is actually located, uh, whether or not you have to be physically in Wyandotte County or just providing services to our residents uh, and being able to demonstrate that. And we, uh, Erica, I know I posed that question to you yesterday. Do you want to answer that for us? Again, you don't have to be located within Wyandotte County for your home base, but you do need to be providing service to Wyandotte County or Kansas City, Kansas residents. And you need to be able to um, show that uh, the, uh, these residents are benefiting from uh, your services and your project. Excellent. Um, let's see, uh, under the, um, the type of organization, small disadvantaged organization, what does that mean? Um, we'll go ahead and follow that one up with email, please. Uh, can you describe the reimbursement process in more detail, the types of documents that are required for submission? Uh, for example, providing direct client assistance for rent is only the clear check required or is additional documentation required, such as copy of the lease? Um, I am not sure what the burden of proof is on that. Kathleen, are you familiar? Well, every agency that ends up getting awarded um, funds will enter into an agreement, a legal agreement with the unified government. And in the legal agreement, all the, speci the specific um, reporting requirements and documents required for um, proving um, that you're actually spending the money on the on the project for which you applied for all that will be laid out in the legal agreement and will be part of the negotiation between the agency and the unified government so you know every every program is different and so the the proof of um that you spent the funds on the on for the services that you were uh, they were intended to is going to be worked out 
get individually as part of that agreement. <clears throat> so, so I, you know, um, so yeah, for that reason, I really can't answer that question with that, a lot of specifics because it just really depends on which what program you're offering. And I, I think it's important to note too, I think there's, uh, because the subcommittee is still kind of going through this process of prioritization, there is kind of an uh, um, uh, ongoing discussion. So I think as we start to see what type of applications come in, we will be able to kind of clarify some of those specifics as well. So um, I think it's really important to get your application in because that will really help the subcommittee really understand where there's great need. We've been, we had quite an overwhelming uh, participation in our first workshop with the community just a couple of weeks ago. So we're really starting to understand where the impact that this pandemic has had on specific communities. And so I think as we're using that data and insight to really help guide the prioritization of these funds. So get those applications in and you know we can kind of figure that out once we start to see what comes in. Uh, all right, a few more questions for you. Uh, this is why we set these sessions up. Um, uh, one uh, question is, two, can two new nonprofits submit a joint application? Yes, that would be um, approved under this as well. Again, make sure that you have a point of contact and include that within your uh, project as you are describing the organizational capabilities. That's a great place to put that as well to make sure that um, we have the understanding that there are two entities that are going to collaborate on one specific uh, project. All right, there, the next question is, is there a limit to the grant funds that we can ask for, uh, for a project? Um, and I think uh, Kathleen partially answered this earlier by mentioning that they will, the subcommittee will be defining kind of an allocation uh, for this grant program, but at this point, there is no kind of limit to what you can ask for. Uh, but of course, we have to remind ourselves that the funds are not themselves unlimited, but we're absolutely trying to leverage every single dollar that we've got. Uh, all right, uh, there's a question again about the portal link. Just a reminder, it is available at ycokck.org slash ARPA. Um, uh, our, uh, I'm not too sure if I fully understand this question. So if you, if you wanna be able to uh, re respond again, uh, follow up with another one. Um, our previous funding amounts for YCO only or overall. So if you, if you submit that question, if you could kind of clarify that for us a little bit. I think wow. if they received CARES funding from a different organization uh, rather than Wyandotte County, yes, we would like to see any of the related funding that you've received from any entity, whether it's the federal government, another county, or Wyandotte County, please make sure to include that. Excellent. All right. Lots of people want to know how much money is available, so definitely tune in tomorrow for that conversation, uh, which we will also post on our website so you can catch that um, after the fact. Um, one question uh, uh, is we have had workforce development issues since way before COVID. What would qualify as a mitigation of the pandemic or resilience in this area? Again, I think that that's one of those pieces where um, if you wanna go ahead and reach out to Emily and I, we'd be happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one to kind of define some of the um, struggles that you've had that maybe been exacerbated by COVID and drill down and help um, to clearly identify and lay out what specific uh, pieces you can apply for under this funding. All right, just a couple more. Uh, can projects with a fiscal sponsorship apply? Kathleen? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what you mean by fiscal sponsorship. So, you know, whenever, when you submit your proposal, you know, put in those information, that information, and Erica and her team will will work through that. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. And then, Erica, this is in follow up to a, a question that you answered earlier. If nonprofits submit multiple projects within one application, would the response be a, or, or approval be for all or none, or would it be possible for a portion or some of the projects to be approved? Each of the projects is going to be reviewed as an individual project. So you can put in five applications or five projects and we will review each independently. It's not going to be as a total of the whole unless there's specific indication in there that you want us to look at the entirety of the project. 
um, but we are happy to look at portions of rather than the total number of projects that were put forward. Excellent. And uh, just seems to be one of the last questions here is, uh, can you have sub recipients for funding such as funding to provide project to project partners? I believe that Kathleen. Wow, can you read that again? I'm not sure I understood it. So can you have sub recipients if you apply? Can you have sub recipients in your in your project? Um, so, um, well, so what you're, I, I'm not sure if you're saying sub sub recipients or just sub recipients. <laughs> so, sub recipients. Um, so if uh, someone applies for funding and then they yes. have project partners, they can distribute that funding to their mm -hmm. partners. Well, um, I, I, I hate to say yes or no directly. I think you, what you should do is submit the proposal and then we'll talk with you about it, right? All right. Uh, is there a deadline to expend funds? Yes, so it's, it's included within the notice of funding availability that all funds have to be expended by uh, December, 2026. Um, great. Uh, and there was clarification on what was meant by fiscal sponsorship. It's for when someone is working with a nonprofit but doesn't have an, their own nonprofit status. Well, I haven't checked the, um, the NOFA. The, so the, honestly, the, the, the use of the word nonprofit is not meant to be strictly strict. Um, we we, it, it, we, it, so, you know, awards can be given to, you know, agencies, organizations. Um, so, you know, so, you know, uh, what, what, again, what we suggest is that you submit your application and uh, Erica will work with you and we'll see, you know, how, how this works. So the problem is, is that we, well, one of the things that we will be doing is a risk assessment of every awardee. And so um, it just depends on the viability of your organization and, um, as to whether that can be done or not, so. And just as a reminder, the, the full commission as part of this American Rescue Plan process has kind of defined several core values uh, for our pandemic recovery, which includes equity, collaboration, innovation, and resiliency. So I think, you know, thinking about those kind of core values as you kind of get into your application, um, that, that type of partnership can be, uh, have, have multiple benefits, but um, as Ms. Von Action uh, remarked, absolutely try to get those applications in and we can kind of take it as a case-by-case -case basis. Oh, you're on mute, Erica. <laughs> so sorry. So Ashley, to touch back um, on the um, yeah. period of performance where uh, we need to obligate funds. So 2.5 within the notice of funding availability on page 10 actually goes into detail um, all the specific nuances of that. Right. Excellent. So a lot, these, a, the, a lot of these, a lot of these rules are as required by the federal government. So some of these rules are not just um, because we're requiring them. So that's why we need to follow what was in the NOFA. All right, and I do believe we have, this is maybe our last question. If we submit multiple projects, do we need to have separate budgets for each project? You need to have a separate budget for each project you want to be reviewed independently. So if you have four projects and you want them to re be reviewed as a total whole, then one budget's sufficient. If you want to have them uh, reviewed independently, then we need a separate budget and budget narrative for each individual project. All right. Well, uh, that seems to have, we have tapered off in questions and I think we've been able to, uh, to uh, hit all of them. As a reminder, we will be sending out a link to the NOFA as well as our website with all of the resources that you need in terms of who to contact with questions. Uh, sometime today. So look forward to that. Um, 
want to thank you very much for your time and interest in this. This is a really important process, and we really are excited to see the types of ideas and projects and proposals that you bring forward as a community. This is something that is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to kind of reset and restart our community uh, uh, post pandemic and build something that's better than what we had. Uh, and I think that's a, just a really unique opportunity and I'm really, really thrilled to have you as part of this process. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We will continue to provide more information online and host uh, kind of ongoing opportunities for you to connect with us, whether it's through community engagement and workshops, or if it's through these types of information sessions on what's happening. And then of course, you're welcome to log in and tune into any of our ARPA subcommittee meetings where several of our commissioners convene with staff to kind of walk through the prioritization of funding and make some key recommendations to the Unified Government Board of Commissioners. So thanks again for your time today. Uh, Erica, Emily, and Kathleen, thank you as well for your time today. We look forward to seeing you soon.